So today I wanted to um, talk about what I do, what I work on at the moment. And I'm um, very much into looking into uh, co-expression networks and especially um, their roles in social insects and the caste development. So I thought I would start with a, a gentle introduction to uh, ants. So for uh, those of you who don't know, uh, ants are really a great model organism. And it's because the ants and social insects in general, they display uh, polyphenism, which is an extreme um, example of phenotypic plasticity. And phenotypic plasticity is the ability of a um, single genotype to express um, alternative uh, morphology, physiology, or even behavior in a response to environmental conditions. And um, polyphenism, it's basically the extreme of this, where an organism is able to um, develop two or more distinct alternative phenotypes, but from a single genotype. And one of the most striking examples of um, polyphenism is the caste system of social insects and ants, uh, with the existence of the two different castes, the queens and the workers. And so one important goal for evolutionary biology is to understand how a single genome can express uh, multiple uh, morphologically, behaviorally distinct phenotypes. But the challenge, it's always been to understand or to um, understand how genotypes can map onto phenotypes. And so because queens and workers basically develop from the same set of genes, it's their, this extreme morphological, behavioral um, or physiological differences that we can see, they basically arise from differences in gene expression. And uh, what do we know about caste-specific gene expression? Well, we actually know quite a lot because there has been a lot of studies, especially in the last few years with uh, new sequencing technology. Uh, but we still don't know if the same set of differentially expressed genes are involved into um, making and maintaining these uh, differences between the queens and the worker. And most of the studies that have looked so far at this caste-specific expression, they have been done on a one or two species, mostly because everybody wants to work on their favorite uh, organism. And so we know that caste differences in gene expression may be, uh, are very versatile, even across closely related species. There are very few genes that seem to be um, shared across species or lineages. And uh, after that, we have also seen that we can see more overlap, but at the level of pathway and biological functions, rather than uh, at the level of single genes. So um, when we look for caste-specific gene expressions, basically we look for single genes that are overexpressed in one of the castes. And is that a, a very, can we really see uh, at the level of single genes what uh, is really happening in these differences? Because yes, in some cases, one or a handful of genes are actually going to be responsible for complex phenotypic traits. But in practice, uh, many of these uh, phenotypic traits are complex and they are highly responsive to the environment, and they are also the results of the combined expressions of thousand genes working together and interacting. So instead, complicated traits are often controlled by network of genes interacting with each other. So why don't we just look at network directly rather than looking for genes differentially expressed? And now we have the tools to actually do that. We can, uh, for example, construct a gene co-expression network. So when we talk about gene network, there are obviously different levels of gene network. But we want to see basically genes that work together, that interact with each other to control a specific cell function. They're important in development, differentiation, 
our response to the environment. That has been shown already before. So we can, um, with the same tools, then when we look at differential expression, we can also construct a um, gene co-expression network, where we look for pairs of genes that show similar expression patterns across samples. And usually what has been found before in other fields is that these sets of co-expressed genes seem to be controlled by the same regulatory mechanisms or belong to the same biological pathway. And these gene correlation they are of course more complex than list of differentially expressed genes, but they are a more realistic approach that has been very successful in the past and we haven't used it too much yet in um, ecology and evolution. For example, one of the first papers uh, already in 2008 that look at co-expression network had a look at the evolution of this between the human and the chimpanzee brain. But co-expression network are actually heavily used in, uh, for example, the field of medicines where they are looking for genes of interest, but also for biological pathway leading to a particular disease. So um, I wanted to start by um, showing our first paper on looking at networks. And this was already done a few years ago, but it's a nice introduction to um, how we construct and what we do with this kind of data. So we wanted to have some kind of exploratory study to look at whether or not we could find sets of co-expressed genes that may be related or correlated with um, one of the female cast phenotype. So um, to do this work, we went out and uh, collected uh, queen and worker uh, samples from 16 ant species that belong to three subgenera. And so we had cast as, or queen and worker cast as a phenotype of interest. But this um, uh, multiple ant species also display other phenotypes, like worker sterility for some, or um, the ability to have multiple queens in a nest, or even uh, the invasiveness. So we had this uh, major data set, which was really big. And of course, the first thing we did, like anybody would do, was to look for genes that were differentially expressed between the queens and the worker. So individually for each um, species. And um, so by examining this cast bias gene expression patterns, we found that if we compare only two or three species, we could find quite a lot of genes that were um, uh, differentially expressed and shared among these species. But the more species we actually add to this equation, the shorter the list of shared differentially expressed genes became. And uh, also we found hundreds or even thousands of genes differentially expressed in one single species. When we look at these 16 species, we could only find one gene that was always differentially expressed. And is myosin light chain responsible for our cast maintenance because we're talking about adults in this case uh, no i don't think so first of all because myosin light chain is actually um, a housekeeping gene that is uh, certainly has a cast bias expression patterns because of um, differences in demands on muscular activity by the queen and the workers but also because there are potentially many more genes that could be differentially expressed um, only if we could um, if we could have collected the, the queens and the workers or the samples at the same time at the same place if we could have controlled a lot more all of these environmental conditions they grow in um, and differential expressions is also just based on a p-value so, of course, any kind of uh, variations across samples might affect. And so, we just think that if we look at this graph, we just see that if we only rely on comparing sets or comparing lists of differentially expressed genes, we are actually oversimplifying 
the characterization of phenotypic traits and their regulatory complexity. So we decided to go um, one step higher and instead of looking at single genes, looking at sets of genes that would be co-expressed. And we constructed an anti-gene co-expression network. So for, for doing this, just quickly explaining, uh, we had to uh, use all of the samples together. So we had all 16 samples in the data sets with the queens and the workers. And we identify modules of co-expressed genes by correlating genes based on their expression patterns and their expression levels across all samples. So basically, we look for genes without having any um, a priori about the samples. We just look for genes that put the queen more in all the work without being different. And when we had within 36 of works that are also called models that included at least 30 genes that were our threshold minimum. And this uh, inc included about 75% of all the genes that we found in our data sets. And the, the other 25% were genes that were either removed because they didn't have enough data across the species or just because they didn't have any um, similarity in gene patterns across the samples with other genes. So it's, it's a quick explanation on how we do it. Basically, we just look for similarity in gene expression. And we uh, constructed an online uh, figure that you can also find online, where so we show um, how networks are. And for each of these models, we have included the, well, the expression level, roughly, but also the name of the gene. So um, basically, if somebody is really interested in a particular gene, it's possible to look for it into the network and see which other genes are linked to it or where it would be. Uh, a gene which is, uh, which is uh, in the middle and highly uh, related or linked to the other genes at the periphery is called a hub genes. And in medicine, they tend to be uh, extremely important for the network. And uh, once we had all of these models, we um, correlated them with, with taking care of also the phylogeny because we had so many species. And we just wanted to see if, this, um, if the expression pattern of each of these models would be correlated with one or the other cast. And we found that indeed, most of our models were associated with either the queen or the worker cast. And uh, what we found is that some models for the worker, for example, were linked to sensory perception, circadian cycle, or behavior, which is the kind of gotum you would um, expect or at least hope to find in your data set when it comes to workers. And for the queen, there were some that were linked to DNA damage repair, for example. And also some of the other phenotypes that we look at, such as worker sterility, were also uh, correlated with some of the models. So briefly, what we found here is that there seems to be evolutionary conserved set of co-expressed genes that we looked across um, 16 species that seems to actually um, regulate the expression and the maintenance of reproductive phenotypes in multiple ant species. So there is a signal, we know that looking at um, multiple genes rather than single genes, we can find um, commonly expressed gene of, oh, sets of co-expressed genes that are maybe important into at least maintaining the differences. And that was also the first um, paper ever, well, we ever wrote on networks. So it was a nice way to show that networks may be a more realistic approach to study transcriptional evolution, not only for CAST, but also for any kind of studies looking at phenotypes. Uh, and then I wanted to uh, look a little bit deeper into these co-expression models, uh, co-expression networks, 
And I wanted to see if we would find the same thing on the single tissue, because we had done it with the whole body. And uh, we also wanted to look at uh, DNA methylation, because, um, well, DNA methylation has been shown to occur in insects. Uh, and also it has been proposed, well, at least a long time ago, that it will be a um, kind of a crucial mechanism to control the developmental path taken by the two castes. So previous studies have suggested that uh, DNA methylation actually play an important role in caste differentiation of social insects. And there has been studies on some of the social insects that have reported um, differences in DNA methylation between queens and workers. But there have also been some recent studies that show no effect of DNA methylation on caste regulation. So it's a very controversial uh, topic, I think, if you talk um, with it with, you know, other ant researchers or social insect researcher, whether or not DNA methylation is actually crucial or not for this. And obviously, for each of these studies that say yes or no, there has a lot of differences. Um, the number of replicates, uh, the study organism, uh, the body part used. So, so far, it's very unknown whether DNA methylation is actually crucial or not for CAS development. So we um, had a look, of course. So we extracted the brain this time uh, because it um, turns out we think it was the best organ at the time to look for behavioral differences, for example. So we took um, adult queen and also the just uh, before they mated and uh, after they mated. So young queen and uh, old queen that have already established a colony, and we also took worker right out of the pupae, and uh, old worker that had already um, established their behavior. So we still use um, ant formica, which is a great model organism in um, Finland. And we extracted both the DNA and the RNA, and we did reduced bisulfate sequencing as well as RNA sequencing to uh, constrict both network a co-methylation and a co-expression network. And the reason why we took adults is, well, first of all, I couldn't get a single brain from a pupil, it all liquefied every time. But um, also, um, we know that at the adult stage, this is where we have the most genes which are differentially expressed between the queen and the worker. So we were really looking for some kind of signal. And uh, first of all, obviously, we looked at differentially expressed genes and differentially methylated genes. We made lists, we had a look, there were hundreds of genes differentially expressed and differentially methylated. But when we started overlapping this list of differentially expressed and differentially methylated, we couldn't find any significant overlap. Uh, we found actually a very weak overlap at the level of go term. So, um, rather at the single gene, but at the level of potentially biological functions, we could maybe see some association between differential expression and differential methylation, but this was not a really great result. So we were um, thinking that it might not actually have any impact or any link between the two of so um, as I showed you previously, we constructed co-expression and this time co-methylation networks. And um, uh, yes, so as before, most of our genes could be uh, partitioned into sets of co-expressed or even co-methylated uh, models. We uh, found a lot of genes that were highly cor um, correlated or highly linked, related to others. And we uh, did the same than before. We look at the correlation between the expression pattern of these models with uh, the two phenotypes that we had. One was a cast, queen worker, and one was a life stage. Young queen versus old queens, young worker versus old worker. And once more, we could find that there were some correlation less than before. 
um, when it comes to the casts, but this time was using a single tissue on a single um, species. So the setting was a little bit different. And for the live stages, there were way more uh, correlations. So this was kind of expected. Uh, we know that there are differences, and we were um, happy to see it as well on the network level. But what was really interesting is that um, we could actually find strong links between uh, methylation and uh, expression when it comes to these um, networks, between both networks. And as you can see in these pictures, there were a lot of genes that belong to a specific models together. So they were co-expressed genes that also belong to the same um, co-methylated uh, module. So this suggests, or at least well, suggests, that there might be some similar factors that affect the expression and the methylation networks. And that could be the result of gene body DNA methylations uh, regulating uh, gene expression, for example. But this, we don't know yet. And we wanted to um, verify this by um, looking whether or not this module could be matched. So there are a lot of ways where we can have a look whether this uh, a model and another models um, tend to be significantly similar. Uh, there is a lot of tests, but usually it takes into consideration not only which genes belong to which models, but also the strengths of interactions between the genes, the position of the genes within the network or within the models. And uh, we are very happy to see that at least two or three models were uh, highly preserved across the co-methylation and the co-expression network, really showing that there were, in fact, some links between both of them. And both of them were correlated with life stages. So whether or not uh, DNA methylation has an impact on caste, this obviously still has to <laughs> be seen. But this was also the first study that looked at co-methylation um, network analysis for the study of CAS specialization. And uh, co-methylation network has also been used in a lot of the other fields, not in ecology and evolution much. But um, it, was uh, it was a good way to um, you know, identify models or genes that may work together in these particular settings. So we could see that there were plenty of genes that could be organized into these sets of co-expressed or co-methylated genes and associated with both cast and stage phenotype. And we also found similarities across the transcriptome and the methylome organization. So co-methylation networks, they are actually, um, I guess a great starting point for a deeper understanding of the complex interaction between the gene expression and DNA methylation, and hopefully their role in phenotypic plasticity. And lastly, I wanted to um, tell you what I'm working on at the moment. So I'm still uh, carrying on my work on uh, co-expression networks, and I want to see a little bit more about the evolution of co-expression networks. So in the first study, we found um, evolutionary uh, stable or reproducible conserved model sets of co-expressed genes across 17 species. But uh, for this study, because we didn't have enough samples per species, we had to construct the network using all of the samples together, all of the species pulled together. So we don't really know how these uh, networks evolve across uh, closely related species. Uh, can we find the same kind of sets of co-expressions or not? And if we find differences uh, across these sets of co-expressions, uh, are there differences based on the network architecture, meaning are there genes that move from one module to the others? Or is it the strengths of relationship between the genes that actually differ across related species. So um, to carry this, I collected enough samples this time uh, of both worker and queen from six formica species. 
uh, we wanted to start with closely related species because I had a quick look at a network between bees and ants and I couldn't find any overlap at all. So maybe if you look at a very much smaller scale, phylogenetic scale, then maybe we can find some sort of signal there. So we sequenced the transcriptome of all of the species. We again took adult and world body for the um, simple reasons that we know there is a signal there. And we know that there are a sets of co-expressions using this setting. So that we carry on using this. Um, I constructed the de novo transcriptome for all of these species. And of course, I had to find autologous genes across the six species. And just like I showed you previously, uh, we had models, we had set of co-expressions, and a large number of these co-expressions were associated with either the queen or the worker phenotypes. So this was to, uh, to be expected with our um, previous work, but it's still nice to see it. And the next step, which I'm still looking into, is uh, how do I um, look at network preservation. Of course, I can, you know, do pairwise comparison, look at whether or not these uh, models are preserved across the, the species. And when I do that, I found that um, there are multiple sets of core expressions that are preserved across at least two or three species. And even one model was conserved across five species and cast associated in three species. But when I do that, it sounds like I'm just comparing list of genes. So right now, I'm uh, working with a professor in computational science, and we want, or I want, uh, ask him to help me with this project because I would like to be able to model the changes across the networks. Uh, can we see how? Um, well, there has been studies that look at how individuals or ants go from one colony to the other in and I want to do exactly the same, but looking at genes. Are genes moving from one module to the others? Are they more likely to be differences across models because um, two species are more divergent on the term of on the scale of the phylogenetic tree? Are more closely related species actually more likely to conserve or have um, genes that are constrained to stay together in order to maintain these phenotypes that we see um, in all of these species. And so it's the first one that we make where we can actually compare networks for species independently. And of course, we find sets of co-expressions associated with each phenotypes, and we also found some similarity across this case specific transcriptome organization. But the next step, because there is always a next step, we need to understand how this caste associated gene co-expression network evolve across species and show across tissue, for example, as well, or during development. This will also be uh, very important to understand or model the changes that we see across uh, all of these species. And that's about it. I'll try to make it a bit short. But yes, I have a wonderful uh, co-author and collaborator working with me on this project. All right, was it OK? Yes, thank, thank you so much, Claire. That was a great talk. Um, now uh, we, have, we yes. have time for questions, for two questions. Um, um, if someone has any question, you can um, write um, a question mark or a Q letter in the in the chat. Brian, <laughs> Brian, unmute yourself. Uh, great talk. Um, I have a question about the, the the methods in a sense. Would there be impact based on the activity or age of the individuals that were looked at for example as a queen goes with age that's one of the great things about queens they can live very very long compared to the workers would there be different pathways and expressions that you would be measuring for example and also for example if you just selected foragers versus uh newly closed adults um, how would that impact your results 
Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think it will uh, actually depend on the settings you are using. If you are pulling all of the samples together to make the network, then uh, genes that would only be expressed into uh, some of the older queens, let's say, compared to the younger queens, they will tend to be correlated together. So in this case, you could uh, easily um, see the difference between this, because there will be networks or models of genes that will only be associated with these phenotypes and not the others. So because we uh, feed the, uh, the software or whatever it is, the package, with the data without knowing any of the phenotypes, it's, it's doing the network blindly. So it doesn't, it doesn't have any bias like we do when we're doing uh, differential expression, for example. So I think when it comes to development, we don't really know how it will impact, but I think it will be very interesting to look at. Okay, any, any other question? Oh, um, uh, sorry, I don't know if I, I, I know how to, uh, yes. It's all, it's all right, I'll just go ahead and ask my question. Hi, I'm Diplo Bindu. I Funny story, I was just running a code, just working with WGSA and I'm trying to wrap my head around stuff. And I was doing the yeah. um, module preservation part of the analysis. I have a couple of questions, and uh, I'm working on uh, Ploridanus, and I'm working with uh, Camponotus Ploridanus and working on their circadian rhythms. So I have an extra layer to add on there is like time. And the more, like, we have preliminary data that I'm currently working on that shows that the nurses and foragers are pretty much two different chronotypes. And the problem is I'm trying to figure out how to correlate these two networks to each other, but also to correlate it to their behavior. To see if I can, if I think about WGSNA, it's basically multiple genes from the same sample and you have different samples, right? So same thing you could do with behavior, you could create a network with multiple behaviors, different samples. Could we correlate that behavioral network to the gene expression network would actually relate phenotype to the genotype or the or the transcriptome. Yeah, I think, I think it's um, already been found as well or looked at, but not, not in ants or social insects. But I have seen it on, on humans where they correlate their um, social behavior with some brain co-exclusion network as well. So the, uh, in social genomics, they do that. And it was really interesting. They actually found a lot of similarities between their behavior and what they would find um, on the gene expression level. So I think it would be really cool to do that because you, you can. So that's awesome. Sorry, I just wanted to follow up on that. It's like the only question is how many, like how many samples do you need? Because the whole idea with WGCNA is there is a whole issue about sample size, right? Yeah, you need a minimum 16, at least recommended by the authors, because mm -hmm. if you have too little samples then, or too few samples, then you have a lot of noise. When it comes to behavioral network, I have no idea, but I will guess you would need at least the same amount of samples if you want to be able to compare them. But obviously my answer will be the more the better. Thank you. <laughs> You know, it's easy to say that when you don't have to spend the money of sequencing <laughs> that many samples. I understand. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. It was a really nice talk, by the way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. Uh, and everyone, if you have more questions, please write it down uh, in the chat. And uh, if, if Claire is still around, it's very late back in Finland. Um, but, but if she's still around, she'll answer that. Claire, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was very fun. Thank you. Um, and so now uh, I would like to invite uh, Buck Tribble. Um, he's a freshly appointed John Harvard Distinguished Science Fellow at Harvard University. And um, he studies the mechanism underlying the mechanisms underlying the development and evolution of morphological cases in nets. So Buck, it's for you. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me and, and great talk, Claire. Um, so let me see if I can get this to work. Is 
Does this look okay? Um, because I can't, I I can't see anyone else. Is that how it was for you, Claire? It looks great. Yes, yes. It looks perfect. Uh, yeah, that's what it was. Just talk to your presentation. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, so I would love for anyone to feel free to interrupt me. By the way, I. I've, um, I've formatted this in a slightly more conversational way and a slightly less streamlined way, just because I, I'm feeling tired and I feel like everyone's just at home feeling a little more casual these days. Um, so the title of my talk is An Hourglass Model for the Developmental Evolution of Ant Casts. And I have this beautiful picture by uh, Daniel Cronauer of these two tiny workers and this tremendous queen of a Doralis ant. Um, and like Flavia did, I wanted to start off with this paper um, by Christian Peters and colleagues. So uh, Christian actually gave me uh, this physical copy of this paper um, in the rainforest in Uganda in 2012. So uh, we were at Ant Course, the image that was shown before this paper actually came out. And Christian was all excited about it. And he gave it to me. And, you know, being this kind of very skeptical thinker, I wanted to knock it down and say that it was bullshit. And I, I don't think it's bullshit at all. I actually think it's really insightful. And um, one of the core ideas of the paper was that um, novel casts like soldiers and ergotoid or wingless queens could have initially evolved from worker queen intermediates or intercasts. And this hypothesis, I think, is compatible with morphological data that they show in the paper and it has really formed the basis of my entire research program. So um, the theory that I'm going to present to you today is really an elaboration. It takes this idea and then it expands it to a whole large number of additional cases as well. Um, and so there, there is a tremendous legacy of, of Peter's work on cast and ants and his creativity and innovation in my research. Um, and I'm extraordinarily grateful for having known him and being able to learn this from him. So, um, with that, I'll give a, a quick outline. So in my talk today, I'm just going to be going through two parts. The first part is proposing a new theory, um, which is trying to understand the genetic architecture of caste development. And the second part is a case study applying this theory to a unique line of mutant ants that we have isolated in the lab. So part one, a theory of caste development and evolution. As Claire alluded to, the morphological casts are one of the really spectacular features that make ants so interesting to study. And part of the reason for this is because an ant colony can't accurately be described as a collection of single individuals. Instead, an ant colony is a coherent social unit or a superorganism. And under this view, the individual ants in the colony are analogous to the cells that make up the body of a unitary organism like you or me. The morphological casts are therefore analogous to cell types. Like cell types, these casts can be divided into a non-reproductive somatic tissue, those are the worker ants, and then a germ tissue, which is the queen. And also like cells, the development of ant larvae into these alternative casts is not an outcome of fixed genetic differences, but it's typically an outcome of phenotypic plasticity. So epigenetic or environmental influences cause larvae to attain these distinct cast morphologies. And I would argue that the morphological casts of ants are one of the most extreme and robust forms of phenotypic plasticity that we see in the natural world. I would be skeptical of any whole individual plasticity that one would argue is clearly more complex or more robust than what ants do. And the only case where I would be very willing to concede that it is in fact more complicated are cell types themselves. So in some ways, the, the casts of ants are giving us a window into how a single genome can produce these distinct output phenotypes. And it's kind of a step on the path toward the massive complexity of cell types that we would see in a, an animal body. As an evolutionary biologist, a particularly interesting fact is that this cast plasticity has been modified by evolution. So from the ancestral system of a wing, wingless worker and a winged queen, ants have evolved many alternative morphological syndromes, like soldier ants that are intermediate between workers and queens. There are species that have lost the winged queen cast and replaced it with a smaller wingless queen. 
There are species that have lost the queen caste entirely and have colonies composed just of workers who reproduce at some low level. And there are colonies that have lost the workers entirely and are composed just of queens uh, at species level. And these all queen species are particularly interesting. It turns out that when an ant species is composed of just queens, these queens can't survive on their, their own. There are no solitary queen ants who just live out their whole life in a solitary manner. There are no colonies where every ant in the colony has queen-like morphology. Instead, an all-queen species is universally parasitic. What these queens do is they infiltrate the colony of another ant species, and they exploit the worker caste to take care of them and rear their larvae, who de develop directly into new queens and mate and fly off and found new colonies. So in this sense, what we can see is that changes to the caste morphology of an ant species are clearly associated with changes in the ecology and natural history of the species. These observations raise a number of major questions that motivate my research. The first is the evolutionary question. How do modified caste systems evolve in parallel throughout the ants? Why are there particular types of morphology that have arisen over and over again? The second is a developmental question. What are the mechanisms that allow ants to do this? And how are ants performing what is arguably one of the most sophisticated forms of developmental plasticity we know of. And the third is the ecological question. How do these changes in caste morphology affect the function of an ant colony and allow different colonies to have different ecological niches and survive in the wild? There are many ways that one could in principle try to answer these questions, but what I was interested in doing, especially building off of the Molay, Peter and, we and Wheeler paper, is um, to build a developmental model. So the hope was if we could have a very strict understanding of the developmental processes that give you a worker or a queen, we might be able to understand how those mechanisms are modified to produce alternative outcomes. In your typical ant species, um, there are just two morphological casts, a worker and a queen, and you do not see any intermediates. But what Christian and colleagues were pointing out in that 2012 paper is that many species do in fact have intermediates between workers and queens. And we call these intermediates intercasts. And I was motivated by that paper to look as closely into the literature of intercasts as I could. And when I looked at the literature, I found something that really surprised me. Instead of having a variable or random combination of worker and queen traits, it turns out that as individuals progress from worker to queen, intercasts pr proceed through a stereotype progression of morphological traits. So the specific details of this progression are beyond the scope of my talk today, but there really appears to be a stereotyped order at which different morphological features switch from worker-like to queen-like status as we look through a series of adult body sizes. And I showed in a paper in uh, 2007 with, 2017 with Daniel Cronauer that this stereotyped order appears to be a conserved feature of caste development that is found all across the phylogeny of the ants. Essentially what this data imply is that caste development in ants is a one dimensional system. There's essentially a single dimension of variation from worker-like to queen-like traits and any individual in a species can be placed at some position along that dimension. And their position along that dimension is very tightly correlated with their body mass or their body size. Knowing that caste is effectively a one dimensional system really helps to simplify the way that we think about caste development. Because for example, if you wanna understand why most species simply possess workers and queens, we could imagine overlaying a bimodal size distribution on top of this reaction norm, where there's one mode of small individuals, all of whom would have worker-like traits, there are no intermediates, and then there's a distinct mode of large individuals, all of whom would have queen-like traits. The major question that this raises is what sets the caste reaction norm? Why is it that size and multiple morphological features are so tightly correlated across the ants? And a reasonable, a reasonable prediction is that there must be some kind of molecular mechanism or pathway to do this. There should be some kind of pathway that receives environmental information and uses this information to induce morphological outputs. So here I'm showing you a formalized version of that statement. This might look complicated, but it's in fact quite simple. The idea is that um, here in this graph, at the top we have 
different inputs that are capable of modulating CAS development, things like nutrition, hormones, and genotype. And what these things are doing is they're leading to biases in the body size of the ant, which I call cast determination. So cast determination is a function of these input variables. Then we have some additional mechanism called cast differentiation that essentially picks where along this queen worker axis an individual will fall. So differentiation is some kind of function of determination. And then we have individual tissues throughout the body of the ants, things like the eyes and the ovaries and the wings and the brain, which will respond to cast differentiation. And each individual tissue will have its own relationship where as a function of cast differentiation, it will have a worker-like or a queen-like pattern of morphogenesis. So this is sort of a formal model of cast development. It's um, very approximate and vague, but it's this, this kind of formal model that we can use to start trying to have a mechanistic understanding of their development and their evolutionary patterns. If you're familiar with the literature on sex development, you'll see that this model has exactly the same structure as models of sex determination and differentiation. And a core prediction of this model is that each of these equations in italics is basically representing some kind of molecular mechanism or molecular process. And mutations that affect these equations or these layers of the hourglass will have different consequences on the phenotype that an ant species will exhibit. So for the next few slides, I'm going to explore what that might look like. The cast determination layer is effectively the layer that produces the size distribution of an ant species, and it affects which regions of the reaction norm are occupied. So if you change the mechanisms of cast determination, you can change which regions of the reaction norm a species will exhibit, and therefore you can change which morphological outcomes will be observed. For example, you could go from a, a worker and a, a winged queen to a worker and a wingless queen by shifting the body size mode down so that the queen is below the threshold size for wing development, which I'm calling trait three here. You could do something simple like delete the large bodied individuals and then you would have an all worker species, or you could induce a mode of intermediates and you would have a species with workers, soldiers, and winged queens. And what I'm showing you here is really just a formalized version of the um, Mole, Wheeler, and Peters paper from 2012. But what about the evolution of social parasites? So, in order, so here I'm showing you a real world example of some carpenter ant social parasites. We have a worker and a queen, and then we have a parasitic species that lives inside their colony. This species is extremely closely related and it would have an ancestor that used to look like this, but it evolved into this new situation where we have this tiny worker sized queen. And if you look at the reaction norm plot here, there's really no way that you could induce this trait by, by producing changes in body size. There's no region of this reaction norm that you could occupy that would give you this phenotype. Instead, to produce this phenotype, what we have to do is shift all the curves to the left to induce the formation of queen-like morphological features even at worker-like body size. So we think that this kind of phenotype cannot result by mutations at the determination layer of the hourglass. Instead, this can only result by mutations at the layer of differentiation. And therefore, if we were able to map or figure out what are the genetic causes of this kind of phenotype, we might be able to figure out what are the mechanisms of caste differentiation more generally. So with that, I'll lead into part two, which are the winged mutants. My model system for a lot of my research is this ant species pictured here, the clonal raider ant. In many ways, this ant has simplified features of its biology that make it possible for us to do highly replicated laboratory genetics experiments. For example, as the name implies, this is a clonal species, which means we don't have to worry about mating them in captivity. And there are in fact no morphological queens in this ant. Instead, we have colonies that are composed entirely of morphological workers. Secondly, it happens to be an ant that is very healthy in captivity. Um, they're robust to many conditions and they tend to grow quite well in the lab. And they also have a quick generation time. It takes seven weeks to go from an egg to an adult who is old enough to lay an egg. This is much longer than Drosophila, but it's in fact much shorter than almost any other ant species you'll find. Because of these advantages, I and others have been developing many new experimental methods in this species. 
So we use this species to make the first CRISPR ants. We can use CRISPR to make targeted um, mutations such as gene knockouts. We can use um, transgenic vectors to insert things like fluorescent proteins. And we can also just grow up huge stocks of these ants and screen for classical mutants the way that William Morton Wheeler did in Drosophila. If we wanted to depict the cast morphology of the clonal raider ant, it quite simply looks like this. We have one mode of small individuals who exhibit fully worker-like traits. And the prediction of the cast reaction norm model is that this evolution happened via a change to cast determination. Essentially, we have deleted the mode of large individuals, but we have left intact the differentiation mechanisms that would induce that if such a large individual could be produced. And there are multiple lines of evidence that this model does accurately describe the species. The first one is that we do see some body size variation in this species, and rare, adult, rare large adults do in fact possess partially queen-like traits. So here I'm showing you a, a worker of the clonal raider ant, and here I'm showing you an extraordinarily large intercast. This intercast arises only at a frequency of something like 1 in 10,000 in the lab. And I would put her right at the center of the cast reaction norm. She lacks wings, but she has partially queen-like traits in terms of things like her reproductive system and her visual system. We also have closely related species to the clonal raider ant that have been described. And from those species, we can see that this intercast is really halfway between a worker and a true morphological queen. Based on these pieces of information, we would predict that there are two routes by which a true queen morphology could be recovered in the clonal raider ant. The first one would be the determination route. We could induce a mode of large body individuals and we would predict that we would restore fully queen-like morphology. The second one is the differentiation route. If we could shift the reaction norm all the way to the left, then at the mode of body size we already have, we could induce queen-like traits. And this would be a worker-sized queen that would resemble these social parasites that have been described previously. So here I'm showing you a wild-type ant, and here I'm showing you these ants that we isolated in the lab that I call the winged mutants. So we came into the lab one day and looked into one of our colony stocks and discovered this bizarre winged mutant just living among the workers within one of the colonies. I took the winged mutants out of the colony and bred them. And as far as I can tell, this is a 100% penetrant genetic line. Winged mutants always produce new winged mutants and wild types always produce new wild types. No environmental variation that I've ever given them can induce this winged mutant phenotype normally. I then did some sequencing experiments and showed that the winged mutants are derived from the colony that we found them in. So here I'm showing you a, to a toy phylogeny to illustrate this. We discovered the winged mutants in this colony called C1. And here's whole genome data from four libraries. What you can see is that the winged mutants are more closely related to each other than they are to wild type ants from their colony, but they're much more closely related to wild type ants from their colony than wild type ants from another colony. What's important about this graph is that colony C1 and colony C16 both belong to the same clonal lineage or the same strain of this species. So in fact, C1 and C16 are almost identical genome wide, but they were collected separately in the wild. So you could think of them as two separate isolates of the same strain. And therefore, what it looks like is that the winged mutants aren't just members of this strain, but in fact, they're members of this isolate, that they're a mutant form of this very genotype. The prediction would therefore be that some kind of mutation happened to some ant within colony C1 that induced this morphological trait. In order to describe the morphological trait, I conducted a morphometric study. So here I'm showing you a picture of a wild type ant and a winged mutant with the wings removed. I took 14 measures from all across the body of the ants, and I used these to perform a principal components analysis. When I did this, I found that my first principal component, PC1, was a very good proxy for overall body size. And here in this graph, what you can see is that the PC1 value and the body length value of winged mutants and wild types are fully overlapping. So they do not seem to differ at all in overall size. Incredibly though, my second principal component, PC2, cleanly separates the winged mutants from the wild types. This is quite nice because I did not program into this analysis that I was looking at two different genotypes. Instead, the algorithm automatically pulled them out and use them as the second major axis of variation because there are morphological differences between them all throughout the body. 
And of course, what those differences are is that the winged mutants possess queen-like traits. Here I'm showing you that the winged mutants have a higher number of ovarials or a more well-developed reproductive system than wild types do. And here I'm showing you the winged mutants have a larger thorax reflective of their wing development. This led me to wonder whether the winged mutants might differ in fitness, and in particular, whether they might lay more eggs given that they have more ovarials. To do this, I took advantage of the clonal raider ant's ability to be reared in large numbers in stereotyped conditions to do a highly controlled study of egg laying rate in winged mutant versus wild type colonies that were otherwise controlled for every other variable. And what I can see is that the winged mutants have approximately twice as many ovarials and they lay approximately twice as many eggs. Interestingly, when I rear up these ants, I observe that they also have a number of negative fitness effects. The most obvious of these is that many of the winged mutants will die halfway through the molting process. It looks like they grow these big bulky wings and they get tangled up in the wings and so they can't successfully molt from a pupa to an adult. In order to quantify this effect, I set up an experiment where I had wild type ants rearing experimental pupae. And in the experimental pupae, I varied the frequency of winged mutants. And when I did this, I found a really nice frequency dependent effect, which is that if only a small percentage of the pupae in a colony are winged mutants, and the survival is 100%, all of them will molt successfully from a pupa to an adult. But if a large fraction of the pupae in the colony, say 50% are winged mutants, then the survival goes down dramatically and many of the winged mutants will die during the process of molting. We thought that this, uh, this combination of positive and negative fitness effects was really interesting because it raises the possibility that a mutant like the winged mutant could actually coexist with wild types in a colony where when they're at low frequency, they have high fitness and so they increase in numbers. But once they're at high frequency, they start dying and they decrease in numbers. This potential for coexistence is very interesting if you want to think about the evolution of workerless social parasites. In terms of the cast reaction norm model, we think that this parasite phenotype could be induced by a differentiation mutation that produces queen-like morphological traits at worker-like body size. And it might be that such differentiation mutants already have some potential to coexist or survive in the colony for a long time. Such a mutant might not be a parasite right away, but if it's able to persist, <coughs> then it would have time to acquire additional mutations that could allow it to evolve into a full-fledged parasitic species, such as the one that we see here. I think the really critical thing to keep in mind for this argument is that there are no parasitic, there are no differentiation mutants or no all queen species who can survive on their own. Instead, species that exhibit uh, queen-like traits at worker-like body size are universally parasitic. So something like the winged mutant might not be a viable species. It's entirely likely that it would immediately go extinct. But the point is it can't evolve into a free living organism. If it's going to survive on the earth, the only way that it could do so would be acquiring uh, mutations that actually allow it to evolve into a parasite. Perhaps less speculatively, these winged mutants are just a very useful laboratory reagent because they allow us to, to study morphogenesis and the process of caste differentiation under controlled and highly replicated conditions. For example, here I'm showing you an RNA-seq study I conducted comparing um, gene expression in winged mutants versus wild types across six time points. What we can see is that in early development, there is no differential expression at all, but once we get to the fourth instar, which is the time when the tissues like the wings and the ovaries are forming, we see a huge peak of differential expression. So this kind of study illustrates that we can use these wing mutants to really dissect how the process of caste differentiation plays out in ants, and maybe to try to figure out what are the molecular mechanisms that drive this process. So with that, I'll just give a brief outlook on some research in the clonal raider ant. Um, in the case of the winged mutants, I'm most interested in trying to identify the causal mutation and then use our genetic tools like CRISPR to experimentally test it. And I will tell you that even though we know that this is a mutant, I do not know what the causal mutation is. There are in fact a number of genetic differences throughout the genome between winged mutants and wild types. And because this is a clonal species, I can't figure out yet which one it is. In addition to looking for the causal mutation, I'm also interested in using this as a model to see what the process of caste differentiation looks like in a developing ant. 
Finally, kind of one of my crazy ideas is the wing mutants teach us that the clonal raider ant is capable of producing types of cast morphology that we don't necessarily observe. And so we might be able to induce other kinds of morphology in this species that we've never seen before. For example, it might have already occurred to you that if we could overfeed them or do something that would produce large body size, maybe we could induce a normal queen sized queen. But maybe it's also possible to produce some intermediate sized individual that could look like a wingless queen. Or if we could figure out what the deal is with soldier ants, we might be able to induce a soldier phenotype as well. So in the long run, I'm hoping that this ant species, because of its reduced and simplified biology, we could use this as a laboratory model to study many different forms of caste evolution in kind of a synthetic way. And then we could compare these results to real world cases of caste evolution in um, naturally occurring species. And of course, I'm interested in going beyond the clonal radar ant. So in fact, I've just started a lab at Harvard and I've hired a postdoc, Sam Arsenault, who is very excited about pursuing a totally new project looking at ants in the genus Leptothorax, which illustrate tremendous morphological diversity and can be, can be used to study caste evolution in a more naturalistic context. Um, the general question that we're interested in understanding is how has this mechanism of caste plasticity influenced the parallel evolution of modified caste systems? And doing this research at Harvard is very convenient because Harvard has the Museum of Comparative Zoology, which is the world's most extensive ant collection. And with that, I should add that um, many of the people in the audience here and many people you know are studying all sorts of amazing and spectacular ants. And now that we've developed this formalized model for caste development, it makes a tremendous number of testable predictions. And so if anyone is interested in discussing this with me or collaborating or even just getting advice on uh, data they already have, I would be more than willing to look at it. I can tell you that this model is really giving us a lot of power to look into caste evolution in a way that was very confusing and hard to do a few years ago. So with that, I'll conclude my talk by saying uh, exi exciting model organisms will continue to yield unexpected and far reaching insights. I would like to thank for this work, first and foremost, Daniel Cronauer, my PhD advisor. Um, I worked with him to first develop CRISPR in ants and also to study these crazy wing mutants. And I now would like to thank my funding, which is coming from Harvard University. I've just started a lab there and I'm in fact working on hiring a research assistant. So if anyone is interested in joining the lab to do things like make crazy weird looking mutant ants, please uh, reach out and let me know. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Oh, Buck, thank you so much. What a good, what a good talk. Thank you. Please, people, reach up, bring questions. Um, yeah, so Matthew asked about, about termites and thrips. And the answer is no, this model does not apply even to bees, really. Um, and, and the way I think about this model is I think we're looking at a specific mechanism that evolved to specifically produce the worker cast of ants. And so maybe by, by analogy, convergently, other groups will have evolved something that sort of vaguely resembles it. But I think the real strength of this model is in its specificity, the fact that we're really talking about one coherent mechanism that evolved at one time. Um. I just want to jump in with, with, the, with the question. Uh, great talk. I keep thinking, though, that um, there's one genus that kind of breaks your model each time, uh, and that is Mystrium, in which it has a worker-sized queen um, yeah. that's wingless, and but it also has a large uh, soldier Over. cast, in a sense. Yeah, so um, I, I kind of consider that the exception to the rule. Um, because if those queens actually had wings and eyes and ocelli, they would really violate my model. And I would have to do some hard thinking to understand it, but they don't, right? They have more well-developed ovaries, but, and, and you might have data to contradict this, but to my knowledge, they do not have a morphological increase in the number of ovarials. And so I think what we're looking at here 
is a physiological distinction. These are not more morphologically queen-like. It's just that for some physiological reason, these are the ones who activate the reproductive system and do the egg laying. And so the point is that we're not, so that in terms of caste morphology, the smaller ones are worker-like and the bigger ones are queen-like. But caste morphology is a totally different beast from caste physiology or who actually lays the eggs. And that can be regulated in the adult stage by entirely distinct mechanisms. And um, just so you know also that um, Christian Peters and I have an unfinished uh, manuscript showing that in like a lot of the doorline genera in Madagascar, which are wingless, you never see winged queens anywhere. But if you start dissecting pupa, you see wing buds, almost all the cases, which is really cool that, um, so that there's this tendency to want to produce wings, but they don't, once, once they close from the pupa, they don't have wings anymore. Yeah, so, um, and, and I've observed this myself as well. So in the clonal raider ant, um, which is a Doraline, uh, these large bodied intercasts will very often have wing buds that can be visible in the pupa. And if you actually watch them a close, you will watch the wing bud get ripped off with the pupal skin. Um, and in fact, this may be what's happening to the wing mutant is that they're trying to rip off the wing with the pupal skin, but because the wing is so much bigger, they get caught up in it and they die in the process. So um, those really are intercasts, right? They're really halfway between worker and queen in terms of of morphology and it fits in other ways because they also don't have as many ovarials as a winged queen would have but they have more ovarials than a worker and they also have partially but not fully developed visual systems like eyes and rudimentary ocelli but not the fully developed ocelli that a queen would have <laughs> 